Hi, my name is Belena Hunt, and I'm here in the Story Garden at the Discovery Center. For me, this is a beautiful place. I wish we'd had this when I was a child. I brought my daughter here, even though they didn't have all this stuff. What this means to me, it shows the growth of Binghamton. It shows the things we do for our children because we love our children. That's why I came here. So I can help these folks raise some money. I hope you'll decide this is worth it and you'll donate to the cause. So without further ado, my first story is going to be Cartouche. It's a lovely story about some unique little animals who find a unique snake. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. And this is Cartouche, and it is written by Stephen Cosgrove. A time or two ago, in a country corner of the forest, lived a dozen or so small creatures called furry eyefalls. The eyefalls were chubby little animals covered from head to toe with long fuzzy fur and two of the largest eyes you have ever seen. All day long, they would walk around the many trails of the forest with their wide eyes open, looking for beautiful things to see. Sometimes they would stop for hours and hours just to gaze at the mountain bathed in morning sunshine. They were known to sit on a beach and stare at their mirrored reflections in the lake. Once in a while, glistening fish would flash to the surface, making ripples on the water. The furries would roll about in fits of laughter as their faces danced about on the lake. In the evening time, as all was getting dark, they would carefully gather twigs and sticks with which to make a fire. As the blackness of the night settled about them, they would gaze forever at the stars in the sky or simply watch the dying embers of the fire. Beauty was all around them and they never missed seeing anything. But, even with the furry eyefalls, there were problems. For you see, the furries were so afraid of not seeing something that was beautiful that they never closed their eyes and never went to sleep. Now all this just caused the furry eyefalls to become grumbly and grouchy. You know as well as I do that if you don't get some sleep, you can get awfully cranky and sometimes downright mean. At least once in a day, one of the furries who wasn't looking where he was going would bump into another furry. And before you could say furry eyeful four times, there would be a fluffy pile of flurries all grumbling and mumbling at each other and nobody saying, I'm sorry. Well, things could have gone on like this forever had it not been for one small furry who stopped to watch a bright green snake who was wrapped around the stem of a flower. All the other furry eyefalls crowded around the stem to see what he was looking at. They bustled and shoved and grumbled and growled at each other as the top, as the beautiful little snake wound softly to the top of the flower. Who's there, he asked quietly as his tongue flicked gently about and tasted the air. Would you look at that, said one of the furries. That snake is blind, for he has no eyes with which to see. Words of pity rang out from the furry eyefalls. He's blind, he can't see, and oh, you poor, poor snake. Well, said the snake, my name is Cartouche, and I would hardly call myself poor. But you must be poor, one of them said. For you cannot see all the riches of the beautiful forest. Ah, said Cartouche, 
Beauty is not just in seeing things. It's also in touching and feeling and hearing things. And with that, Cartouche listened very quietly and heard the beautiful forest growing in the warm spring air. Well, the furry eyefalls were not to be outdone by a green snake. So they began listening very hard to hear the beauty. But once again, somebody slipped or maybe he was pushed and the grumbling and mumbling started all over again. Cartouche listened around and then laughingly said, you call me four for I cannot see, yet you must be four for you cannot listen. Oh, no, that's here. Okay, ready? We'll Go ahead. do that. Cartouche listened around and then laughingly said, you call me poor for I cannot see, yet you must be poor for you cannot hear. Oh, yes, we can, they said. Just listen to this. And with that, they tried with all their might to listen to the beauty around them. But somebody coughed, somebody sneezed, and then somebody banged somebody on the knees. And then everybody started grumbling and mumbling again. It's no use, said one of the furries. We'll never be able to listen. None of us ever gets any sleep because we're afraid we might miss something beautiful. And because we don't get any sleep, we'll always be grumbly. And because we're grumbly, we'll never get to hear anything beautiful. Cartouche smiled a secret smile and slid down the flower to the grass below and wound himself up on a tall mushroom. Gather round, he whispered, and I shall teach you how to listen. All the furry eyefalls crowded about, trying to get close to the emerald snake. Now all of you, said Cartouche, sit very quietly and softly close your eyes. The furry sat down with a bump on the grass, and after squirming on the ground around for a bit, they all, one by one, began to close their eyes and listen. I can hear it, exclaimed one. I can hear something beautiful. And sure enough, in the distance, each one of them began to hear the soft, quiet beauty of an evening cricket. Keep listening, said Cartouche, and you not only will feel the wondrous things around you, but in your mind, you will dream of all the beauty you have seen today. One by one, the furries gently fell asleep as the sounds of evening wove their dreamlike spell. Cartouche listened to the soft sounds of night around him, and he thought, I may, be, I, I may not be able to see with my eyes, but I can see all that I need to see when I listen with my mind. And with that, he fell fast asleep. You may see all the things around you, but you may feel nothing at all. So try to close your, so try and close your eyes so tight and listen to the nighttime fall. The end. My next choice, okay, looks kind of scary. It's a really big book, but it is a book of poetry. No, I promise I won't read it all to you, but there is a special one in here might want to save this one for later tonight when the kids are ready to go to bed. Because all the way back here, we have a wonderful old-fashioned poem about three little people called Winkin, Blinkin, and Nod. Winkin and Blinkin and Nod one night sailed off in a wooden shoe sailed on a river of crystal crystal light into a sea of dew. Where are you going and what do you wish? The old moon asked the three. We have come we have come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea. Nets of silver and gold have we, said Winkin, Lincoln, and Nod. The old moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in the wooden shoe, and the wood that and the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew. 
The little stars were herring fish that lived in a beautiful sea. Now cast your nets wherever you wish, never afraid are we. So cried the stars to the fishermen three, winking, blinking, and nod. All night long their nets they threw to the stars in a twinkling foam. Then down from the skies came the wooden shoe, bringing the fishermen home. Twas all so pretty a sail it seemed as if it could not be. And some folks thought was twas a dream they dreamed of sailing that beautiful sea. But I shall name you the fishermen three, winking, blinking, and not. Winking and blinking and two are two little eyes and nod is a little head. And the shoe that sailed the skies is a wee one's trundle bed. So sh shut your eyes while mother sings of wonderful sights that be. And you shall see the beautiful things in you rock, as you rock in the misty sea. Where the old shoe rocked the fishermen three. Winking, blinking, and nod. And the credit for that poem goes to an individual named Eugene Field. For my other story, I have chosen my own personal favorite, The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Wonderful story. Let's enjoy it together. Far out at sea, the water is as blue as the bluest cornflower. It is clear as glass and deeper than any chain can reach. There live the mer people down in the deep. You may think there is nothing at the bottom of the ocean but white sand. That is not so. The most wonderful trees and plants and water flowers grow on the ocean floor, and all kinds of fish flit in and out among the sea branches. In the deepest place of all lives the king of the mer people, in a palace made of coral and muscled sh mussel shells. Once upon a time, the king had six mermaid daughters. The youngest mermaid was the most beautiful of all. Her hair was long like spun gold, and her eyes were a lovely sea green. And like her sisters, the youngest mermaid had no feet. Her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long, the mermaids played in halls where water flowers grew out of the walls. And when the castle windows were open, fish swam in and out, just as birds sometimes fly in when we open windows. Some of the fish even let the little mermaids pat them. Outside the palace, each of the mermaids had her own garden, which she could plant however she wanted. One mermaid had a well-shaped flower bed. Another one had Another one had shaped like herself. The youngest mermaid's flower bed was round. All the flowers in it were red and gold, the colors of the sun. And in the middle of her garden was a statue of a handsome boy carved out of clear white stone. The little mermaid found the statue inside a wrecked ship. The little mermaid was happy in her sea home. But one of the things she liked best was to hear her grandmother talk of the world above of ships and cities and human people. How the little mermaid longed to see this world. When you are 15, said her grandmother, you will be allowed to go up out of the sea and sit on the rocks and look for yourself. This was a privilege that was to be given to all the mermaids on their 15th birthday. Each sister promised to tell the others what she saw on earth when it was her time to go up. But none was so full of longing to go as the youngest mermaid. That year, the oldest sister was 15. When she came back from a day on earth, she said she had seen hundreds of wonderful things. But what she liked best was to lie on the sandy beach in the moonlight and watch the winking city lights and listen to the faraway sounds of people. The next year, the second sister went out of the water. She saw a whole flock of white swans flying in flying across the red gold sky. The third sister was the most daring. She swam up a wide river. She saw houses, children playing, and a dog who barked at her and scared her away. She said she would always remember the green hills on the earth and the children who could even, who could swim even without a fish's tail. 
The fourth sister did not go near the land. She stayed in the sea during a raging storm and watched the ships and dolphins. The fifth sister's 15th birthday was in winter, so she saw quite different sights. Iceberg th icebergs that glittered like diamonds, but were bigger than the church towers built by men. The fifth sister sat on the edge, sat on one of the largest icebergs, her long hair streaming and warned passing ships to stay away. The five older sisters were delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw above the sea, but now that they were allowed to leave any time they wanted to, they lost interest. The five sisters had become lonely away from their ocean home and agreed that it was where they felt most happy and content. Only the youngest mermaid felt differently. If only I were 15, she sighed, I know I would love the world above the sea and the people who live there. At last, the youngest mermaid was 15. Come along. Come along now, her grandmother said, and put a pearl pin in her granddaughter's hair. Then the youngest mermaid rose, lightly as a bubble, through the water. It was early evening when she came to the surface. The sea was completely calm. A sailing ship on it didn't move. But there was music and singing on the ship. The little mermaid sw swam right up to the cabin window. She rose on the crest, crest of a wave and looked inside. And that was when she saw the prince. He had large green eyes and was very handsome. It was his 16th birthday, which was the reason for the singing and the celebrating. When the young prince stepped out, stepped out on the deck, hundreds of rockets shot into the air. The mermaid had never before seen fireworks and was frightened, but only for a moment. It was beautiful, like all the stars of heaven falling. The little mermaid couldn't stop looking at the ship and at the handsome prince. The calm ended and a great storm rose. The waves splashed higher and higher. Lightning flashed, thunder roared. The ship rolled in a wild and tumbling sea. The little mermaid was not afraid of the high waves but the sailors on the ship were. The ship creaked and groaned. Soon the mast snapped like a stick. The ship turned on her side and the water rushed in. The little mermaid saw the people on the ship were in great danger. She searched for the young prince and caught sight of him just as the ship broke in two. He was sinking down, down into the deep sea. For a second, the mermaid was delighted then she remembered that a human being could not live in the water. Quickly, she swam in and out of the floating boards to where the prince had disappeared. She had to save him. Deep, the mermaid dove in, into the water. She found the prince and gathered him into his arms. His eyes were closed. He was too tired to swim anymore and would have died if, she hadn't, if it hadn't been for the little mermaid. Morning came. The storm was over. Color returned to the prince's cheeks, though, this, though his eyes stayed shut. The little mermaid kissed the prince and thought to herself how much he looked like the marble statue in her garden. Then the little mermaid saw land. The waves were carrying them to a sandy beach in front of the large church. The mermaid laid the prince on the sand, taking care that he faced the sun so that he could warm him. All at once, the church bells rang. A group of girls ran from the church garden. One of the girls who had lovely blonde braids and eyes as, as sea green as the mermaids saw the prince and went to him. As she did, the prince sat up. He smiled at the young girl and held out his hand to her. The prince thought it was she who had saved him. He didn't see the little mermaid who had hid behind some rocks and covered her face with sea foam. Sadly, the little mermaid returned to her father's home. Her sisters asked her what she had seen, but she told them nothing. The little mermaid felt too unhappy to speak. Many an evening and many a morning, she rose to where she had last seen the prince, but she never saw him, and each time she went home, sadder than ever. The little mermaid's one comfort was to sit in her garden and put her arms around the marble statue that looked so much like the prince. At last, she could bear it no longer and told her sisters what had happened. One of her sisters had heard of the prince and knew where he lived. Come, little sister, she said. 
Then all of the sisters linked arms and rose out of the water. The, the, the little mermaid saw the prince's palace, which was very splendid and beautiful. Now that she knew where he lived, the little mermaid came often to the surface and sat under the prince's balcony. Nightly she watched him, though he never saw her. More and more the little mermaid grew to love the prince, and more and more she wanted to live in the world of people. Her grandmother tried to explain the differences between human people and mer people. They have legs, she told the little mermaid. We have a fish's tail. Oh, said the little mermaid, I would gladly give my fish's tail and even all my years living underwater for wash just one day on land as a human girl. You must not say such things, said her grandmother sharply. We have a much happier life here. I don't care, said the little mermaid. Grandmother, isn't there anything I can do that will make me a human girl? Only one thing, answered her grandmother. You must win the love of a human man. He must love you so much that he marries you. Then you too would be human. The grandmother shook her head. But this is foolishness. For what we find pretty down here, a fish's tail, they find ugly on earth. They think that two clumsy thing called legs are beautiful. The little mermaid looked at her fish's tail and sighed. Be happy with what you have, said her grandmother. That night, the mer people had a party. All the mermaids and mermaid mermen danced to the sounds of their own voices, which are very lovely. And the most beautiful voice of all belonged to the little mermaid, though she did not feel like singing. Instead, she left the party and went to visit the sea witch. I have always been afraid of her, she said, said the little mermaid but perhaps she can show me how to become human. The sea witch was sitting next to her pot of nasty smelling blue. Ha, she said with a sneer. I know why you came, but you are a fool. Exchanging your fish's tail for stu two stumps called legs will only bring you pain and sorrow. Still, I will give you some of my magic broom and, how to, and tell you how to do it if you want something, if, if you give me something in return. What? asked the little mermaid. Your lovely voice, said the sea witch. Then what will I have left? asked the little mermaid. Your face, your long golden hair. Enough to charm any man, said the sea witch. But, continued the witch, there is one more thing. If you do not win the prince's heart, you will turn sea foam the morning after he marries another. I will gladly take that chance, said the little mermaid. Then she swam to the shore with some of the magic brew. The minute to her, she put it to her lips, the mermaid felt a sharp stabbing pain as her fish's tail turned into two legs. She fainted, the pain was so great. And when she woke up, the handsome prince was standing in front of her. The prince asked the little mermaid who she was and how she got there. Alas, she couldn't answer because she had given away her voice. All she could do was look at the prince. The prince took her by the hand and they went into the palace. Every step the mermaid took on her new legs hurt, just as the sea witches warned her. The little mermaid was given lovely clothes to wear and she was by far the most beautiful girl in the palace, even though she couldn't speak or sing. The prince was completely charmed by her. Daily they went horseback riding in the green woods or climbed mountains together. One day, the prince told the little mermaid, you are dearer to me than anyone else. What the prince meant was that he liked her best as a good friend. It never occurred to him to make the little mermaid his wife, for the prince was still in love with the girl he thought saved him after the shipwreck. That girl is the only girl in all the world I will marry, he told the little mermaid. You are a lot like her, but you are not her if only I could find her again. Not being able to speak, the little mermaid could not cry out, cry out, but it was I who saved you. How it hurt to know the prince loved another. Still thought the little mermaid, I am here and she is not.
Soon there was a rumor that the prince was going to marry a neighboring king's daughter. I don't intend to marry her, the prince to told the little mermaid, but I might as well be, be polite. So they set out in the royal ship to visit her country. Most amazingly, the king's daughter turned out to be the very girl who had found the prince on the beach. It is you, cried the prince. What I never dared hope has come true. Oh, I am all too happy. The little mermaid heard the words and felt her heart breaking. The wedding was planned for that very day. The morning after would mean her death. She would turn into sea foam as soon as the sun rose. That night in the neighboring king's country, church bells rang, cannons fired and flags waved from the windows. After the wedding, the little mermaid wished the bridal couple joy in spite of her breaking heart. You must stay and be friends to both of us, said the prince. Then everyone back, got back on the royal ship. There was laughing and dancing and a party which reminded the little mermaid of the night she first met the prince. And though her heart was breaking, she danced for the prince and his bride. After this evening, I will never see him again, thought the little mermaid sadly. I have given up my home and my family and my lovely voice for him. I had no idea it would happen, that he would really marry another, and now he has. Much later, the royal couple went arm in arm to their cabin. So the ship became quiet. The little mermaid st stood on deck looking out at the sea. All at once she saw her sisters rise to the surface of the water. Their hair was short. It had been cut off and given to the sea witch in return for a sharp knife. Here, said the eldest sister holding up the knife, plunge this into the princess's heart before the sun rises. Do this and you will not die. Instead, you will grow a fish's tail and become a mermaid again. Hurry, the sister, sisters urged. The sky is already getting light. Then the mermaid sisters sank back into the water. The little mermaid went to the prince's bed and drew aside the curtains. But instead of killing him, she bent down and kissed him. She looked at the sky already glowing pink. Then she looked at the knife in her hand. The little mermaid still loved the prince. She could not hurt him. Suddenly she flung the knife far out, far out into the ocean. And right after, she threw herself from the ship. Down, down, into the sea she fell. And as she fell, she felt her body dissolving into sea foam. Yet oddly, the little mermaid didn't feel dead. She felt the foam being gathered up and shaped into another form. To whom am I coming, she asked. Soft voices answered, to the daughters of the air, although you did not win the love of a human man, you have suffered and been brave and unselfish. You have raised yourself into a world of the spirits of the air. We fly unseen and do good deeds. You will too. The little mermaid lifted her arms towards the sun. For the first time, she cried real tears. And for the last time, she saw the prince and his bride. They were on the deck of the ship searching for her. The little mermaid blew them both a kiss and then, with the other daughters of the air, soared off on a pink cloud to bring happiness to others, especially to little children. The end.